So, uh, so I will talk about um, strong coupling or strong interactions between light and molecules. And well, as at least some of you are doing things which are pretty remote from what I'm doing, then I'll, I'll try to, well, I'll assume you know nothing, and please excuse me if you do. And uh, I'll try to, to concentrate more on explaining the concept rather on results. Okay. And so actually this, this work uh, started in the group of Thomas Ebersen in France where I did my postdoc. Um, and since the beginning of this year, I'm in Tel Aviv. So as I'm new, I thought I'd give some quick introduction of my, my lab. So Yael joined me after finishing a PhD in, in Be'er Sheva. And together with Katrin and Karen, they are here in the audience somewhere. Uh, Gary and Tom had to stay home because they now study hard for their exams. Um, and so these are the main tools that we use in the, in, in the research. So we have a spin cutter for making thin films of, of polymers and, and, and organic layers, uh, and a sputter machine for making uh, metallic layers, and then some steady state uh, spectroscopy instrument. So this is actually this is actually a uh, Yuval's microscope, and this is a, a fluorometer of Gaussian, is somewhere. But anyway, we use them, and uh, and last we have uh, a pulse laser system that we use for time resolved ultra fast uh, spectroscopy, like a pump probe, and time resolved fluorescence uh, measurements. So what do we do with all of these nice toys? So we study the interaction of molecules with light in nanostructures, and the type of molecules that we focus on are organic dyes, so fluorophores, organic fluoros fluorophores, and these molecules interact with light normally by absorption or emission of photons, where the energy of the photon matches exactly the transition between the ground state of the molecule and its exact and exercise state. Okay. So this is actually the reason why Many materials have different colors and emit a different, uh, different wavelengths. Uh, but actually, the, this, this absor absorption can drive many processes. There are many chemical processes that are related to this interaction. Uh, for example, photochemistry can work in a useful or bad uh, direction, like photodegradation. And today, there are, there's a lot of work on, on organic electronics, like we had from Shachar. Uh, Stock. So we have photovoltaics, so we have a photon which creates a charge separation, a, a, a pair of hole and electron, and then we can take these charges and drive current from them and use them for as, as, as a power source. Okay? The opposite effect is like in organic LEDs, so we take tar charges, we inject them into our sample, and then when the electron and hole meet inside the, the molecule, they recombine and emit the photon. Okay? So that's nice. So these are all very interesting processes, but in, in principle, the functionality of all of these molecules is a given property of the molecule, and normally it depends on the chemical structure of the molecule itself or its immediate environment. Okay, so if we want to change something here, then we need to, I need to go to, to Gauzin and ask him, please synthesize a new molecule for me, and maybe it will work. Okay, so what I, want to show here is that there is some other alternative for this. Okay, so, uh, and the alternati al alternative comes from our ability to control the optical side of these reactions. Okay, so <coughs> as you probably, well, you might know, there are many, many different structures that we can use for confining the, the, the light, we can use to trap light inside them, and by that, we can enhance the intensity of the, of, of the light and focus it down to very, very small areas. Okay, and there are many different geometries, many different materials that can do that, um, either dielectric or metallic, which we call uh, plasmonic structures. And maybe the simplest one to understand is what we call the fabri fabri cavity. Okay, so this is just a pair of mirrors. So in our samples, we use uh, just two thin layers of silver, so they act as, as partially transmitting mirrors, and they are separated by a gap which we usually use uh, some polymer spacing. Okay, so now if we shine light on this 
uh, on, on the sample, then some of it will penetrate to the mirror and go and start bouncing between the two mirrors. Okay? And we'll have multiple, uh, multiple reflections here. And in each round trip, some of the light will leak out of, the, of, of this cavity. Okay? So now we have two interesting effects here. Well, one, because we have multiple reflections, then every photon that goes inside will stay here for some time. Okay? And in the meantime, more photons are coming inside. Okay, so we have, we have energy accumulating inside this cavity, what we call a field enhancement. Okay? Another property is that because light is a wave, as we heard before, then waves interfere with it. Uh, wave can, 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 go into, uh, can undergo interference. So all of these multiple interference, uh, all of these multiple reflections will interfere with themselves in such a way that only, only wavelengths where the accumulated phase along one round trip is an uh, integer uh, multiple of 2 pi, so the phase of the wave reconstructs itself after one round trip, only these wavelengths will be able to penetrate into the cavity and go out. Okay, so we, can, we have this kind of system that can selectively respond to light. This is what we call, normally call a resonator. Okay, so we have, and of course, the wavelength that can go in, into, into this cavity depends on the distance between the mirrors because it sets the accumulated phase in one round trip. Okay, so we have this kind of device that we can control its optical response by geometrical properties. Okay, so here you can see different, the, the transmission spectrum, the, the optical response uh, for such cavity when the only thing that we change is the distance between the mirrors and we can tune the, the, wa the resonant wavelength as we want across the whole visible range. Okay? And of course, other waves, other wavelengths where the, we don't have this type of constructive interference, they, con uh, they interfere destructively and then the light just cannot penetrate into the cavity. Okay? So we have zero transmission. Okay? So this is one uh, example. A different type of interesting example is this kind of uh, plasmonic color ray, so this is just a, a thin sheet of, uh, of, of gold, or actually silver, I think, doesn't matter, acts the same, but here they made holes in a periodi periodic way, and so with equal distances, kind of a hole, what we call a hole array, and the only difference between these two sides is the periodicity of the structure, okay? So when we take this sample and we put it inside the microscope and shine white light through it, then we see that on one side, the red light passes, and on the other side, the green, green light passes. Okay? The only difference, this is exactly the same material on both sides. The only difference is the geometry. Okay? So this is, this is one example. And, and when, we, when we talk about photonic structures, then people usually have in mind artificial structures. Okay? But actually, we can find it actually also in nature, because, for example, this butterfly, when we look carefully, when we look carefully into the, 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 its wings, we see that there's some periodic structure. Okay? And this is exactly what gives its color. So if we take the wings of the butterfly and grind them, we'll be left with just gray material. The color is gone. Okay? And this is exactly, so, okay. The cavity, this is exactly what we see also if we have uh, like a, a film of water on top of our oil stain. Okay? We see these, these colors, I'm, I'm sure you familiar with it. Okay, so all of these examples are ways to control optical response by geometrical, or by the geometry of the, by the structure. So going back to the cavity, as I said before, because of these multiple reflections, we have field enhancement. Okay, so if we have some photochemical reactions going in some, uh, in, in some molecule, and we put this molecule inside this cavity, because we have accumulated energy here, which is higher, and it can be by a factor of 10 or by a factor of million even in, in, in some structures, because the intensity is higher, then we will enhance the effect of light on the molecule. So this is exactly the idea be, behind surface enhanced photochemistry, which is a subject that uh, Avram Nitzan from our department worked on many years ago, but I'm doing something completely different than that. So before I go and explain what I mean, 
I want to take you a little bit back to classical mechanics. Okay, no light, no molecules. So what we have here is, uh, is a, a pendulum. Okay, it's an oscillator, and it, it oscillates right with a certain frequency. And so this is something we all learn, right? So this is one, and it's not. Uh, it's pretty boring when we take two of these and connect them somehow, for example, by a spring, then let's see what happens. We start one of them, then it oscillates, and then the other one starts oscillating too. And it's a bit chaotic, but we can notice that at some point the first one will stop moving and the other one will start oscillating. And after some time, this will stop and, and the first one will start oscillating again. Okay, and it goes back and forth. So what we have here is that the two pendulas actually exchange mechanical energy. Okay? They interact, they, they are coupled, and they transfer mechanical energy between them. Okay? But when we analyze this motion, and so the fact that, that this motion is, um, is, is non-stationary okay, means that looking at each one of these oscillators individually is not the right way to analyze this system. We have to look at the whole system as one entity. Okay, and analyze it as one entity. And when we do that, we see that the coupled oscillators have two oscillation modes, okay? A symmetric one, okay, when they oscillate in phase, and an anti-symmetric one when they are out of phase. And if you look carefully, you will see that this one oscillates a bit slower than the single oscillator, and the, the anti-symmetric one oscillates a bit faster, okay? So actually what we have is that the original frequency split into two newer frequencies as a, as a result of the coupling between the two uh, oscillators. Okay? Okay. So that's, that's easy, right? So as it turns out, there's a, there's a quantum optics analog of that. And actually it was realized about 30 years ago. And I'm doing the same quantum optics analog, but with molecules. Okay? So what do I mean? So as I said before, we have this optical microcavity with a resonant response around some wavelength and the response, the absorption of the molecule, which is also usually resonant. And by playing with the geometry, as I said before, we can tune the cavity to exactly match the resonance of the molecule. Okay? So now these two, these two systems can interact with each other. How? Well, if we take the molecule and let's say we start with the molecule in the excited state, then this one molecule will go will decay to the ground state by emitting a photon, okay? Just like in fluorescence. But other than, in, in, differently than, than fluorescence, instead of the photon just going out to free space and, and then lost, the photon is trapped by the two mirrors, okay? So it stays there for some time, and during this time it may be reabsorbed by the molecule, okay? So the energy goes back to the molecule and excite it again, and after some time it will be re-emitted. So we have, again, exchange of energy between the molecule and the cavity, okay, but in the form of photons. Okay? So we have the same type of coupling or interaction, which, or resonant interaction, which results in the splitting of the response into two, uh, two, two absorption lines. Okay, so this is exactly like the two frequencies that we had before. And they de designate the two new quantum states which are shared between the molecule and the cavity. Um, when we anal analyze this system, so the, the, the distance or the gap between these new states, this is called the, 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 the Rabi frequency, no, the, the Rabi splitting energy. And what does it depend on? Well, it depends first on the transition dipole of the molecule which makes sense because we want a molecule that interacts strongly with light. Okay. Then it's proportional to the square root of the number of molecules in the cavity. So we want to pack them as, as many molecules as possible. Okay. So this is why we usually work in, in solid state, uh, in solid state phase. And then it, it, it's inversely proportional to the mod volume. So this is the, the volume which is occupied by the electromagnetic field in the cavity. So it's, it's roughly the mode, the, the volume inside the cavity, okay? And because it's inversely proportional, then we want to make this volume smaller and smaller, which means none, okay? And that's why I'm here. But one thing that is interesting to note, and this is quite remarkable, is that this splitting here, 
doesn't depend on the intensity of the light. Okay? So strong light matter coupling doesn't mean that we need strong light intensities. And well, in fact, we don't need any light at all. Okay? So these new, these, these new quantum states, the splitting, will appear as soon as we put the molecules inside the cavity. Okay, so, so how, can, how, how can we use it somehow? Well, all of these processes that I talked about in, in before, they depend on the electronic structure of the molecule or the, the, energy level, uh, the energy level diagram of the molecules. Okay? But here, when, well, as, as we now know, when we put the molecules in the cavity, then we create new energy levels. We create new quantum states. Okay? So in a way, we now have a slightly different molecule. And if we have a slightly different molecule, then maybe it will have some different chemical properties. Okay. So that's the question that we asked ourselves um, some time ago. Can we change the, 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 the chemical behavior, material properties, by strong couple? So to, to, to start exploring this question, we, uh, we, we took uh, molecules with some molecular functionality, and we chose photochromic molecules, so spiropian. Uh, these are, so photochromic molecules are, are molecules that have two chemical structures, two, two isomers with different optical properties. So the spiropian isomer is transparent to visible light, and the merocyanin is optically active. It absorbs photons at 560 nanometers. And we can switch between these two isomers by using light. Okay, so we start with this transparent film, we radiate with UV light, and gradually we convert these molecules to this form and create more and more molecules in, in this side of the reaction. And as you see, as we do that, we build up an absorption peak, okay? which is proportional to the concentration of molecules which went to this state. Okay. So now we take this, this molecular film and we put it in a cavity, okay? just between, these, between our two silver, uh, silver uh, mirrors. And of course, well, at the beginning, if all the molecules are in the transparent form, then the cavity doesn't see them. Okay, they are optically inactive. Okay, so as far as the cavity is concerned, there's nothing in there, just the transparent material. Okay, and what we see is the normal transmission peak of an empty cavity. Okay, but now we start, we, we, we turn on the UV light, and we start converting molecules from this state to this state, and we see that gradually the new the, the two peaks of strong coupling appear. Okay? And we see that the distance gradually grows because as, as more and more molecules went to this the optically active state, the coupling is stronger. Right? Because, as I said before, the coupling is proportional to the square root of the number of molecules in the cavity, but only the optically active ones. Makes sense. So, so that's a nice way to tune the coupling strength and then see how some the, the, the properties of, of this coupled system change. And actually, we made it up to 700 MeV, which is kind of a world record, at least until recently. We broke it again. Um, but, but you see, it's, this is quite a, a big change. It's not, uh, it's not a small perturbation, okay, 700 milli electron volt. Okay, so, so that's nice, but how can we see whether the, the, the chemistry is changing? Okay, that's what we wanted to see. So, well, it, it changes, right? But, uh, so, so if we want to see that, what we can do is, um, is monitor the absorption of the molecule as a function of the rad radiation time, okay? And we, from that, deduce what is the concentration of molecules in each one of the isomers. And we do that for this kind of sample where half of it is covered by two metal films. So we have the cavity and one doesn't have the, the, the second one. So it's, it's a bare film. It behaves as a bare, as a bare film. So for the bare film, as you see, we radiate the, uh, the sample with UV light. Okay? And we gradually convert the population from the spiropyran to a merocyanin. Okay? And this is in log scale, so the process is almost mono-exponential. Okay, and from the slope here, we can get the rate of the reaction. When we do the same thing on the cavity side, then we see that 
Well, initially, the rate is the same, which makes sense, because at the beginning, I have just a little bit of molecules. I just started to convert molecules, so I'm not in strong coupling conditions, and then it makes sense that the rate here will be the same, but as strong coupling kicks in, you see that the rate becomes slower and slower. Okay, so we managed to affect the reaction by strong coupling. Okay, and we want to make sure that this is really because of strong coupling, so the way to do it is, well, we, what we can do is change the thickness of the polymer or the distance between the, between the mirrors so that we shift the cavity resonance away from the molecular transition, okay, so they don't interact with each other anymore, and then the rates with or without the cavity are exactly the same. Okay, so this is actually the first. What is the y-axis? Here? Yeah. This is the, well, this is the logarithm of the difference between the absorption at the photostationary state and the current state, or at, at, at time t, okay? But then I take the log, so, so it converts the the exponential growth to a linear curve. So it's, in a way, it, uh, it's not exactly the same, but it, it is, it's proportional to the concentration of the spiropian population. Okay, so, so the spiropian disappears as the merocyanin is formed. Okay, so, so that's nice, and that was actually the first time that uh, that, that it was shown that strong coupling or quantum optics effect can do something to chemistry. Um, how am I doing with time? Huh? Ah, okay, plenty of time. Okay, so, so we actually have some model to explain why things happen as they do and, and, and what actually stand behind this. So first, to understand it, let's look at the model that describes uh, photoisomerization in, in normal situations. So we have on one side uh, the, the spiropian molecule, so it's ground state and the excited state, and on the other hand, on the other side, we have the merocyanin molecule, again, ground state and excited state. And in between them, we have what we call the, the potential energy surface, okay? So it's some kind of, uh, of, of potential that the molecule goes to as it is converted from the merocyanin, from the spiropian to merocyanin. Okay, it has to go, it, it, it's like a, you can think about it as a classical particle which you take in some, in some, some, some potential, uh, some uh, long term potential, okay? So we start in a spiropion and then we, when we excite it with UV light to, to, to the excited state, then it can either decay back to the ground state or go into some intermediate state from which it will either relax back to the spiropion or undergo a bond breaking, so there's actually a, a, a bond in the molecule that breaks, and it will convert to the merocyanin form, okay? But on the other hand, once we started generating merocyanin, then they can also be excited by the, by the same UV light, okay, and undergo the reverse process, okay? So we actually have the forward and backward processes taking place at the same time, okay? It's not just, a, it's not just one direction. Okay, and, and the reaction as we see it, as we measure it, is actually a balance between these two processes. Okay, and the rate of the reaction, what we measure in the experiment, and you can uh, solve kind of rate equations to see that, is the sum of the forward and backward. Okay, it's the sum and not the difference as maybe you would say from, from the top of your head. Um, okay, so this is for a normal molecule, no cavity. But when we put it inside the cavity, then, well, the spiropian side, because it's transparent, it doesn't interact with the cavity, nothing changes, it stays the same. But the merocyanin, once we get to strong coupling condition, its excited state splits into two new, uh, the, the two new quantum states, okay? So now, when we excite the molecule on this side, it will quickly go to this lower excited state and from here, it would be harder for her, for, for, for the molecule, to cross this, the, this intermediate state and convert back to spiropion. Okay, so in effect, what we actually do is reduce the backward 
at the backward rate, and this is why we see a slower reaction, uh, a small, slower react net rate for the reaction. Okay, so the, the conceptually we have that the coupling between the molecule and the cavity just changes the whole landscape of this reaction, and, and from, from because of that, it will change the, the chemical behavior. So um, that's very nice, but now we have a lot of work to do because this is actually a very powerful tool that we can control the, the, just by setting the electromagnetic uh, boundary condition by playing on optical resonators, change the chemical and, and material properties. Okay, and there are many, many different things that you can do with that. Some ideas that, uh, that I'm starting to we are starting to work on now is to see how this coupling changes the, the, the internal dynamics of the molecule, okay? Because again, we create new energy levels. This will change the whole behavior of the, of, of the molecule. And this is, we saw evidence for this already, but this is something we need to understand. Um, another aspect is how interaction between molecules is affected by, by this uh, strong coupling, by the cavity. Okay, there are many different uh, processes that can change because of these, the, the creation of these uh, energy levels. Um, some very interesting property here is that because we have, we have in the cavity many, many molecules, okay, and we have many molecules that all interact collectively with one photon, okay, with the same cavity mode. So this induces some coherence between them and, and can, can give some very exotic states of, of matter that we want to explore. And last, well, we, we studied this effect with a very simple geometry, uh, Fabric Perot uh, cavity. But as I said before, there are many different geometries that will have this kind of optical resonance. And in particular, um, nanoparticles, metallic nanoparticles or nanogaps. And then it's, it's interesting to see how these different geometries affect the whole behavior of strong coupling. Uh, strong, strong coupling uh, and the chemistry, and maybe we can even go to the level of single molecules, strong coupling of single molecules, and to study chemistry on a single uh, molecule level. And as I said before, there are many different things, and actually the, the, the range of, of, of this, the applicability of this idea actually goes maybe as, as far as molecular functionality goes. Okay, so you can think of many, many other different things. And if you have some molecule, which you know, then if you put it in the cavity, most chances you'll get something interesting. Okay, so even better, send them to me and I will get something interesting. <laughs> and so I think I will stop here and thank you for listening. question of an, an organic chemist. Mm -hmm. Did you look at the orientation of, of your uh, dyes and how the orientation of how the dyes are organized within the cavity influenced the mm -hmm. So, um, well, because of the way we, because we use spin coating for, for making this, uh, this molecular film, then let's say most chances the orientation is random. So we have the molecules oriented in, in, in all directions and of course, the coupling between the molecule and the, the, the cavity, or the coupling to light, depends on the orientation. Because if it's, if it's the, 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 the transition dipole of the mo molecule is perpendicular to the electric field, then they, they don't see each other, okay? So we have some averaging there. And of course, if we, make, if we can make the molecules all aligned to the same direction, we'll increase the effect. But, you know, it might be interesting, but it's not something which is the difference won't be dramatic. It's a factor of probably square root of three or something like that. One more question? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.